This, this was said by Edgar Dijkstra uh, 45 years ago. And what I hope to do in this lecture is to show that he was right uh, and that although he thought that by the end of the 1970s, so just eight years away from when he was, was writing and speaking, um, people would be able to develop software that was virtually bug-free by using the kind of methods that he was advocating. Uh, we, we have now just about got there. We, there are companies that, that know how to produce virtually bug-free software that can do it routinely and are doing it routinely as part of their normal commercial activities and are able to offer guarantees uh, as part of their normal business. So I want to show you that that's happening. I, I hope to convince you that, uh, that that really is feasible. And I'll go through this at, at quite a speed because most, I've got too many slides as usual, and most of the um, information and important references you'll find in the transcript, um, along with some additional information as well. So, correct by construction. What do we mean by correct? Uh, the software needs to do all the things it's required to do and nothing else for all possible inputs, and you need verifiable evidence that that's true. And only then can you really have confidence in, in the system. Those of you who've been with me through this lecture course from the beginning will have seen this slide before. This was an experiment that Watts Humphrey of the Software Engineering Institute did. Um, 810 industry experienced industrial programmers more than 8,000 programs. These are the kind of defect rates that he found in the software that they were producing. Uh, the upper 1%, the one out of 100, were still producing 11 defects, just over 11 defects per 1,000 lines of code. And the average programmer was doing far, far worse than that. There's no reason to believe that we're doing any better than this in general today. So, program correctness, and one of the other things that Dijkstra said in, in that same uh, lecture in, in The Humble Programmer um, was that it's not only the programmer's responsibility to get the program right, but to produce evidence that it's right. And those two things are extremely important, and as we shall see, you need to produce the evidence while you're developing the software because it's too expensive and quite often impossible to do it any other time. So what do we mean by the required functions? Um, clearly you have to, to say what it is you're going to do completely unambiguously and self-consistently, otherwise you don't know what's needed. You don't know what you're doing in, in a real sense. And, and that means that it won't do to have user stories as, as the agile people um, put forward because they're, they're always ambiguous and incomplete. And, and it's no good to go down the military, you know, typical defence contractor route of having huge documents with, with thousands typically of the, the system should do this, the system should not do that. What you need is a formal statement, a clear statement of the system states that it can be in the operations that, that move it between those states. And it needs to be formal, and any formal statement that is manipulatable is a form of mathematics. We have mathematics, you can underpin this sort of formal statement using relatively basic mathematics for most of the things you need to say. So, you know, there are, there are some bits of abstruse mathematics that are being used in formal methods, particularly by researchers, but as far as the industrial use of mathematically rigorous notations for saying what you need to do and how you're going to do it is concerned, it's only relatively basic mathematics that you need. Um, when, when I was involved running, running Praxis back in the 1980s, we used to teach the mathematics that was needed in a day. And we never encountered anybody who couldn't learn that uh, mathematics in a, in a day if, if they were a, a reasonably intelligent person. There's a list there of formal methods that are used for specifying systems, um, a list of, 
of just some of the ones that are routinely used in, in industry, although none of them are extremely widespread yet. And I'll come back at the end of the lecture to considering perhaps why that might be. So we know what it needs to do, the software, but for all possible inputs, that's a challenge. Uh, you can't test all possible inputs, that's obviously impractical. Uh, we've, we've explored that space in previous lectures. But you can see what happens for all possible inputs using analysis and proof. Uh, but only if the specification and the design and the code are written in formal languages which are susceptible to being analysed and proved. And if you do it that way, that also produces the verifiable ev evidence that you need. And this is the process, in essence, that I call correct by construction. Now, the need to do that analysis has been well understood from the beginning of computing. Uh, Alan Turing wrote a, a, a wonderful paper in 1949 called Reasoning About a Large Routine, in which he, he drew the analogy that even in arithmetic, if, if you're, for example, you, you have to check that somebody has added up a large column of numbers correctly, you can break it down into subtasks that can be carried out in parallel and checked independently. Because you can simply check each column of the addition and you can check that the checksums are right, that the, the carries are right between the columns. And that gives you the ability to check the entire operation. But the individual columns could be checked by different people uh, in parallel. So you can separate out the functions, the, the tasks required to do that checking. Similarly, he reasoned, if you have a, a program represented by a flowchart, you can annotate the flowchart with things that should be true at each point in the execution of the program. And that gives you the ability to break down the job of determining that your flowchart of, of your program does what is required and produces the right answer. It breaks it down into separately checkable steps. Uh, and he even spotted the fact that to make it a, a full, full proof, you need to be able to show that the program does in fact finish, that it, it does terminate. And so he, he talked about uh, as well about how showing uh, how you would show that the, uh, all the loops terminate and that therefore the program terminates. And Cliff Jones has written a lovely paper about this paper and about three or four other papers that were written by other computer scientists and mathematicians around the same time and, and shown that what they're describing is a workable method for reasoning about the correctness of software. And, and Cliff's paper uh, goes on to show how the ideas there are essentially the ideas that were then worked on in the 1960s by computer scientists such as himself, by, by Floyd, by Tony Hoare, in producing the foundations for the kind of formal analysis and, and reasoning about programs that, that is going on today. Uh, there was a, a big 10, 10 year, 15 year gap before those ideas really got, got picked up between Turing and, and Floyd. But um, nevertheless, the, uh, the groundwork, the insight, uh, had been produced by, by Turing. He'd, he'd realised that testing simply would not be enough. And in the, the NATO software engineering conferences, um, an IBMer who was, was there um, produced the insight that any significant advance in programming was going to require programming languages that were susceptible to analyses. And that was an insight which was fairly widely shared among the computer science community. Uh, Bob Phillips, who was, was head of command and control at um, the government research establishment in Malvern, the uh, it, it's had various names over the years, the Telecommunications Research Establishment, the Royal Radar Establishment, the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment. Um, it then became DRA and, and finally got sold off and became uh, Kinetic. Bob Phillips was, was running Command and Control and, and he led a project 
um, secret project to do analysis of software because he recognized that there was going to be a need to make sure that, that the um, flow of programs and the, um, the way in which um, answers were derived from, from different data items, different inputs, would need to be able to be analysed very tightly. So, that you, for example, you could spot Trojan code that was, um, you know, if, if something was, was dependent on, on, on the clock time and it shouldn't have been, for example, you needed to know about it because it might have been a mistake, but equally it might have been somebody inserting something uh, to make it go wrong at a particular time. That, that work, he... Unfortunately, he had a heart attack and, and the work had to be taken over by, I um, uh, can't remember, uh, John Cullier. And, and the, that analysis team uh, started collaborating with, with a group at Southampton University led by Bernard Carey that was doing um, graph analysis of, of software at the time. So there was this, this secret project, and when Brian Gladman took over as head of the computing division at, uh, at Malvern, he declassified it because he could see how important it was going to be for civil software, particularly safety critical and security critical software in the civil world. Uh, and I think that was a, an enormous benefit to, to society that Gladman took that decision. It, he had quite a fight getting it, getting it through... Uh, various other government departments, as you can imagine. That work led to two analysis tools. Two analysis, there, was, there was Malpass, which was used uh, retrospectively for a, a very um, after-the-event analysis of this um, shutdown software for the sizable B nuclear reactor. Uh, and it led to Spark, and we shall talk a bit more about Spark in, in a moment. And the, the Spark developments were, were picked up by Bernard Carey at Southampton. Uh, he took them into his own company, Program Validation Limited. And it's, it's from that which, which moved into Praxis and then into Altran, uh, which has actually led to the, uh, the, the thrust of activity that has developed Spark the way that it is, has developed to today. Um, if you want a good readable introduction to and handbook on, on Spark, then, then John Barnes' uh, book there is, is the one to read. Uh, John's in the front of the audience. If you brought your copy with you, he will undoubtedly sign it for you afterwards. Spark is a, a powerful programming language. It's a, a subset of, of ADA, and these days it's, it's a subset of ADA 2012, it's been kept up to date with all the revisions to the ADA programming language. Um, the fact that it's a strict subset of ADA gives you the advantage that you have compilers available for quite a wide range of target architectures. It, because it limits itself to, to a subset and to simple, simple use of that subset for, for reasons of verifiability, well, I'll come on to that. Um, it, it tends to use highly reliable parts of any compiler that it's using. So it's, it's pretty unusual that you actually discover a compiler bug in, in compiling uh, Spark in, into, uh, into programs. Uh, the only things that are left out are things that can't be analysed in, uh, in a static way because the important issue about Spark is, is that you need to be able to analyse the meaning of the program statically in order to be able to verify that, that the claims that you've made about the relationships within that program are in fact correct. So it contains powerful constructs for programming, powerful structuring constructs for building large systems, um, specification of, of entry conditions and exit conditions from, from parts of code, pre and post conditions if you, if you know the terminology. Uh, assertions about, about the state of the, the program at any given point, uh, and the ability to limit the ranges of data so that uh, you can say that you know, this is an integer and it can only have the following set of values, for example, within, within this range. That gives you the ability then to analyse the program to see whether that range could ever be violated. 
So it, it adds to the power of the analysis that, that can be done. And Spark includes a set of automated uh, static analysis and, and proof tools that enable you to guarantee that there can be no runtime failures. You can't, can't run out of resources, you can't violate array bounds, you can't create memory leaks. All those things can be, can be proved. Um, more details at, at that link and in the references in, in the transcript. So Spark is, is logically sound. The, the behavior of the program is completely predictable. It's formally defined. It's got formal semantics, so it can be checked. Um, as I said, it's bounded in space and time, so you can reason about its resource uses. And it's got a minimal runtime system, so you're not dependent on a, a lot of code that you haven't had any access to. And it's used in this process of correct by construction. And the principles are that you, firstly, you avoid introducing errors in the first place. And then you find those errors that you do introduce and, and you will make mistakes to, to err is human. Uh, you find them as close to where you made the mistakes as possible so that they're as cheap to fix as possible so that there aren't too many consequences that you have to, to go back and rework. And to do that, you use mathematically formal notations as early as possible and then throughout the development. You take very small steps, so you don't make great semantic leaps in, in moving from a, a specification to a design, for example. You, you move forward making small design decisions, and each one you verify against the previous statement of the system, so that if you make a mistake in taking one of those small steps forward, you, you pick it up straight away because you carry out a proof that what you have done in adding this extra bit of detail hasn't actually introduced anything that conflicts with things that you've said before. You do this with a lot of powerful tool support. Um, and, and the notion of static analyzers that find errors is familiar to every, every programmer because that's what compilers and syntax checkers do. Um, they find syntax errors in your programs. If you, know, if, you, if you write something that doesn't make sense in the language, then the compiler will, will give you an error message and tell you that's, that's simply not, not correct. And that's done statically. It's, it's done by looking at the program text, not by trying to run it. The thing about Spark is that it not only formally specifies the syntax of the language, but it specifies the semantics, the meaning of the language, and therefore the static analysis can pick up errors in the meaning as well as in the syntax. Correct by construction encourages you to do the hard things first. You know, if there are things that, that are going to be difficult, then build prototypes, try them out, um, try and get all the really hard things out of the way. Um, again, a, a bit of a, a conflict with, with the agile approach of the notion that, that, well, you can always refactor the program when you discover that you've taken a, a catastrophic decision at the beginning. Uh, that turns out sometimes to be harder than, uh, or quite often to be harder than it looks. And, and you want to write software that, that isn't tricky. You want, you want your, your software, your design to be as understandable as possible, as simple as possible. State very clearly what it is you want to do and, and do it simply, because that will make the verification easier and it actually makes the code run faster because the compilers are then better at optimizing the, the code if, it, if it's very simple. These were some, some early projects that used this sort of approach. And, and if you look at the right-hand column, you, you see the, the defects that were detected in these projects. Um, and, and they're all less than the one defect per, per thousand lines of code. Um, contrast that with the 11 defects per thousand lines of code that Watts Humphrey was finding in the best 1% of his programmers. Um, and, and some of them are substantially less than, than one defect per thousand lines of code. 
Uh, the first one there was, was a project on which we actually bet the company when, when I was running Praxis. The, it was a fixed price project for, for national air traffic services that was worth more than our annual turnover at the time and, and would have killed us if, if, we'd, uh, if we'd messed it up. Um, that, that system is still running. Um, Nats tell us that it integrated with the rest of their systems more easily than, than any system that they'd bought before. Uh, and interestingly, about every five years, they, they call us up. They, they now call Altran up and ask them to rerun the course, the, the training course for the operators that tells them how to start the system up uh, because it doesn't fail and so they, they forget. Um, the, other, the other project here, I'll, I'll talk about a few of them in, in more detail later on, but, but Solis was a, a system to, to guide bridge officers in how to land helicopters on, on um, military boats at sea, um, the safe conditions and the you know, wind directions and the direction that the ship needed to be pointing in for particular helicopters to be able to land safely. Uh, the Multos CA is, is the um, security uh, certification authority for, for um, the Multos smart card. Um, a is a, is a military system. And, and the, the NSA system is this one, which I, I want to talk about in a little detail. The National Security Agency in America has a, uh, a system that they use uh, as a, a demonstrator to, to experiment with security problems. It's this, this enclave. They have a, have a secure enclave, a, a, a room, let's call it, with a door. Uh, the door is under the control of a, of a system. In order to get through the door, you need to present your, your um, security pass and your fingerprint. And the ID station then, um, if you've got the right level of credentials, uh, and all those things have matched, opens the door for you and you can go in. And there are various other functions that, are, um, that have to be provided. There's a, there's a guard in there and the guard has to have a, um, a pass so that they can access the system. The guard has to be able to override the door in certain circumstances and so on. Now, the problem the, the NSA had was that um, they're, they're building secure systems, they're in the security business, and they were trying to conform reasonably to the uh, common criteria, to the international standard for the level of assurance that you need for security. This is the seven levels of that, and you'll see that, that EAL 5, um, assurance level 5, is semi-formally designed and tested. You, you only get into formal verification when you, when you really get to the highest level at, at level seven. And the problem the NSA had was that they were being told by their suppliers that achieving EAL5 was too difficult and too expensive. So what they did was they asked Altran, Praxis at, at the time, to, to carry out an experiment to see whether the correct by construction techniques that, that were being used by Altran um, would actually enable um, the, the token air system to be re-implemented um, in a, a cost-effective way. So they, they want an experiment done. First thing to do was to determine the boundary of, of the system. That, that diagram exists in the transcript. You can, you can look at all the details. It was going to be necessary to, to map out exactly what the, uh, the core functions of the ID station were and how they interfaced with the peripherals and with the other activities going on. These were the functions that needed to be implemented. Um, controlling user access, of course, right down to um, letting the guard override the door, um, having a security officer able to shut down the configuration, um, being able to, to archive a log of events that had to be maintained and so on. Again, there's much more detail in the transcript and in the referenced reports from the Tokenir system, um, which you will be able to find if, if you want to follow this through. Tokenir development process uh, was the correct by construction process. And if you, the, the main line down here is, is largely what you'd expect. 
the, the system already existed because the NSA were redeveloping the system. That was the experiment. We've got a system, now let's redevelop the software and see how it compares with, with what's been done before. From that, a system requirement specification was produced using a, a set of methods essentially based on Michael Jackson's problem frames, um, which I've, I've talked about in previous lectures, some of you may recall, again, reference in the transcript. From that, a formal specification is produced, mathematically rigorous, but very abstract specification, in this case, using the Z notation. And then a formal design is produced by adding in the kind of details that you're going to need as you move from the abstract specification in, into the, something that is, is detailed. Design decisions have to be taken about what kind of types you're going to use, well, how, how things are going to be implemented. And you move, as I said, in, in baby steps. So there is a step-by-step -step gradual process of just adding more information, taking design decisions and documenting them in the formal design. That moves down to the informed design. This, this is the point at which you take the formal design and add into it the package structures, the, the system architecture that shows how you're going to design the, uh, to, to uh, implement the activities and, and spread them out between the different components that you're actually implementing and, and how those are, are going to communicate and down into an implementation in, in Spark, in, in the language that I've just been talking about. Now, alongside that are the uh, security, development of the security requirements. So the protection profile leads to a, a security target, which informs the formal specification, and to stated security properties, the things that the system must or, or must not do. And from the formal design, uh, you, you develop a, a test specification because we're going to run system tests later on. And the formal design contains a lot of information that gets carried into the Spark implementation so that the Spark tools are able to actually check that the code really does reflect that specification. The assurance process, we've got the, the development process here, but you can carry out a proof on the formal specification to show that it's self-consistent, for example. You can carry out a proof of the security properties using the formal specification and the security properties, showing that the formal specification does have the properties at the abstract specification level that are required by, by the security specification. The formal design, you can carry out refinement proofs to show that each step that has been um, added in, each, each new inf set of information that has been added in as you move forward towards a more and more detailed design, is genuinely consistent with the step immediately preceding it. And, and each of these steps throws up mathematical proofs that, that need to be, to be uh, carried out. then the functional properties can actually be carried out in, in, in the Spark system. The security properties, again, can, can be um, shown to be consistent with the Spark implementation. And a lot of this is done by the static analysis tools, which look at the Spark, look at the, the formal specification as recorded now in the in the Spark code by way of contracts between, between different components, the tools generate a lot of very tiny mathematical proofs, thousands and thousands of tiny mathematical proofs that need to be carried out in order to show that actually you haven't made a mistake, that everything is still consistent. And the proof tools, as part of the static analysis, then actually prove those things for you automatically. And a very, very high proportion of those proofs can be carried out automatically. Some of them will need a bit of human guidance, but, and, and some of them occasionally will need, need uh, 
uh, total human oversight. But in general, they will be, be discharged automatically. Um, and, and then the implementation can be, can be run against the, the system test as well, because we've got the system test specification here. So that's the assurance process that's going on as you are developing the software. What kind of size of system are we talking about? Um, not, not vast. I mean, it was, it was implementing all the functions that, that you saw before. Um, the core software, these sort of, 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 of numbers, so about 5,000 executable lines, about 6,000 um, annotations that show the, the flow of information and the flow of control through the Spark. Uh, and about 2,000 annotations that actually show the things that need to be proved in order to, to show that you really are implementing the specification. Um, and then, then below that, the, the support software that, that was written in, in ADA to provide you know, the um, access to the peripherals and, and the uh, simulation of the peripherals. The productivity for this, this project um, for the core software, um, during coding, uh, 200 lines of, of code a day, which is, is quite startling. I mean, those of you who are, who are experienced programmers, I hope, will recognise that that's, that's very high productivity. And, and it's high productivity because you have done so much early on to, to really understand what it is you're doing and to separate out the issues that might cause you delays while you're while you're working. Uh, overall, if you include the entire life cycle, uh, you're still uh, at, at 38 lines of code a, a day, um, including all the production of, of all the documents, all the documentation, final reports, and, and so on. Now, when, when that was presented to the National Security Agency, some, some little while later, um, Randy Johnson of the, of, uh, of the NSA came to a Spark user group meeting and, and told the tale, they explained what had happened. And so what I've done is to take his slides from that presentation. And I've, I've um, taken a few bits out of them, but basically these are, these are his slides. This is what he told the Spark user group. This was a project that took 260 person days, a team of three people part time, it cost a quarter of a million dollars over nine months. The testing criterion, it was the software was sent off to, to their test centre in Albuquerque to be, to be really thoroughly tested. The criterion that they were looking for was 99.99% .99 reliability at the 90% confidence level. Um, they didn't find any critical failures in the software at all. In, in doing that. Now, that compared with also the, the productivity figures shocked the NSA. This was, was higher productivity than they had ever seen on any project that they had ever had carried out. So they assumed that that Janet Barnes, who is, who is here and will answer any really difficult questions that you've got at the end, uh, who, who was the project manager and the technical lead for that project, they assumed that she and her, her colleagues were superhuman programmers and designers and that it couldn't be done by ordinary people. So they introduced phase two. They had three summer interns uh, in the, in the uh, NSA, um, two undergrads and, and a computer science grad with, with this background. And they gave them a task. They said, adapt the praxis code to run on the real system rather than on the, the simulated peripherals and add new functionality. What we want to do is to um, add in uh, an encrypted password uh, and a keypad device that requires that you type in the password and, and check that as part of the authentication process alongside the, the fingerprint and, and the scanning of the, the pass already. And they wanted the students to follow the complete correct by construction methodology. 
they were given minimal training. Um, tiny amount of, of work on Z, um, a bit of support for the, for the tokenier system and, and the hardware, of course. Uh, a day on Ada, uh, about a week on the on the on Spark and, and the tool set, and they had textbooks and manuals and and some email support from from Altran, who who were no longer on site. And this is what Randy Johnson told the Spark Use Group they achieved. They added the new functionality, they followed the entire process through, they, they did what was required, they followed the correct by construction process, they produced uh, error-free code, uh, they ran the Spark tools and, and produced the necessary proofs. Uh, and, and then as a final flourish, because they'd still got some time left, they actually built the Spark tools into their local programming environment, to, uh, to, which they weren't even asked to do. And the NSA's conclusions, again, presented at the Spark User Group, are that the create by construction approach meets the common criteria for, for EAL5, but goes beyond that um, because it includes much of, of EAL6 and EAL7 in terms of the level of assurance that it's being provided that it produces code much more quickly and reliably and at lower cost than traditional methods that it's commercially supported, has a reasonable learning curve, that it's proven and practical. That was the NSA's conclusion from that project. Now, Altran worked hard to get the NSA to publish all this because they, they felt that it was something which other people could benefit from. And finally, despite their, their um, resistance, because of course they're a secret organization, they were persuaded that it would be a reasonable thing to do to to publish it, and, um, and, and that was achieved in, in 2008. So all the documents, all the specifications, the code, um, everything is online. You can download it. You can download it, you, uh, and all the tools are online. All the Ada tools, all the um, Spark tools uh, are all available for free download online and uh, all the links are, well there's, there's one there, there's links in the transcript. So you can download this system, you can make modifications to it, you can, can run the proofs and, and see whether you've broken them, you can repeat the process and lots of academics have done that now and, and have used this as a way of testing their own formal approaches using new tools, new approaches, new provers that, that didn't exist at the time that this project was carried out. Um, a small number of bugs have been found in the code over, over that period. Um, the, the academic view is that it's astounding that such a, a low number of bugs has been found given the analysis that's been done using methods that weren't available at the time that the, the software was developed. And you'll see, again, a reference to the reports that have been written that explain what errors were found, um, what kind of impact they had, what techniques were used for finding them. That's all in the transcript you, you can find. Uh, Microsoft are very interested in informal software verification, um, particularly since Tony Hall moved there from Oxford University. And uh, in 2011, um, Janet Barnes and, and Rod Chapman won the, the very first Microsoft Research Verified Software Milestone Award. Uh, and there they are with, with their award. <laughs> I needed to put that up. I knew it would embarrass them, and they didn't know it was coming. So that's given you a flavor of what correct by construction is. Now, now let me just tell you uh, about a few practical projects as, as well, because you know, that one was, was the NSA experiment. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just quickly look at some aspects of, of these. Uh, the Lockheed C-130J, the, the flight control software, um, much of it um, need, was safety critical and needed to be developed to level A of, of the um, standard for, for um, aircraft software, avionics software. Uh, in other words, the, the highest level of, of verification, the one that's supposed to get to you a, a, a failure rate of, of um, failure probability of, of 10 to the minus nine per hour, one, one failure in, in a billion hours. 
Um, Lockheed used Spark as part of their development process, and they announced at a, um, a conference somewhat later that the costs of testing they found had been reduced by 80%, that code quality had improved by a factor of 10 over their, their normal approach for developing this sort of software, that productivity improved by a factor of four, um, and, and when they then used the same process on, on another aircraft, uh, they got another improvement factor of four because they, they were now uh, much more used to using the system. These are the defect rates that Boscombe Down, or the Ministry of Defence anyway, found in the Lockheed flight control software when they did a deep analysis of it uh, when, when the UK bought this aircraft. Uh, and as you can see, the, the defect rates for, for C are really very high per thousand lines of code, coming right down to uh, Lockheed had, a, had achieved a, an average of, of four defects per, per thousand lines of code um, in, in the Spark code that they produced. But you know, some of, when you think that this is flight critical software, that's, that's being developed um, using best industry methods by a leading manufacturer of, of, um, of aircraft software. The, these give you an idea of, of just how serious, a, how big a, a change it makes to move to a spark-based, correct by construction way of working. I mentioned Scholis, the, the helicopter landing system. Um, Z specification, again, code developed in Spark. Um, th this, this had to meet the defense standard 0055, which, which requires a full formal proof. It was the very first UK Ministry of Defense project that, that had to have a full formal proof because of its safety critical status. Uh, it was 42,000 lines of code. That produced 9,000 of these little mathematical proofs, verification conditions, as, as they're called. Um, and, and the defect rate was down at 0.22 defects per thousand lines of code. Uh, Mr. of Defence were very happy with that. Um, this was the, the Mondex um, certification authority for, for the smart card. Um, and again, this time we've got 100,000 lines of, of Spark, of ADA, bit, bits of C++ and SQL, three trivial defects and one spec defect that were fixed under, under warranty. Um, works out again at uh, 0 0.04 defects per, per K-lock. Um, this is, is the air traffic control system which has been keeping you safe if you've flown in UK airspace in the last few years. Uh, it's, it's the IFACT's um, air traffic controller tools, which, which they do medium-term conflict detection. They give you a look ahead that, that has increased from two minutes to 15 minutes, and, and they do trajectory prediction in, th in three dimensions, um, taking account of, of the weather, of the wind speeds, and so on. The idea is to enable the controllers to give aircraft uh, clearances that are already known to be free of conflicts in order that the controllers don't have to speak to them again in order to move their, their path for fear of them uh, running into conflict with another aircraft. Because the, the main limitation on the amount of aircraft that can be packed into a, a sector of airspace uh, is actually the uh, availability of enough time on the voice channel for the controllers to talk to the pilots. And so in, if, if what you need to do is to be able to move more aircraft, what you have to be able to do is to move them safely without talking to them. And, and that's a large part of the benefit that comes from, from this system. It's safety critical because it means that actually, uh, under some circumstances, the air traffic controllers have to have more aircraft, they're able to and do have more aircraft in their sectors than they could handle safely without the tools. So the tools, the tools are vital, they, they have, to, have to continue to work. 
uh, and, and have worked extremely well. The um, uh, delays in UK airspace have gone down significantly. There haven't been any incidents um, that are attributable to any of this. Quite a big system. Um, generated 150,000 verification conditions. Nearly 99% of them are actually proved automatically by the, by the tools. Uh, it's about a quarter of a million lines of code. Uh, again, full, full formal specification in, in Z. This is just a, a screen from the, from the system, and that, that's the layout of UK airspace to um, give, give you a view of you know, just how much of, of uh, airspace is actually being controlled. Um, National Air Traffic Services are very complementary about the system. You may be wondering, how long does it take? You know, you, you've got something that is, is really tightly tied down, formally specified. What, what happens if you need to add some features to it? You want to make a change to it for some reason. How long does it take to, to recreate the proof? And, and the answer is that if what you're doing is making a change, a relatively small change, and you, and you want to, to check it out to... Uh, to, to make sure you haven't introduced any errors as a consequence of that change, it can be reproved in 15 minutes. If you need to do a, a full uh, ab initio proof, then, then you're looking at something that needs to run overnight. But um, because these small verification conditions, these tiny mathematical proofs, um, statements that have to be proved, uh, are independent, and because they are... Um, mostly not affected by changes that you make. You know, a lot of them won't be affected by, by a, a, a change that is, is made. You can, you can cache them. You, you can simply reuse those proofs. You don't need to recreate them. And, and this whole approach of generating verification conditions means that actually you can outsource proofs if you want to, even if your, your system is, is top secret. Even if your, your system is highly safety critical and top secret and you absolutely mustn't let anybody know what it is you're doing, the proofs don't contain enough information for anybody to be able to deduce anything about what the software is actually doing because they're simply small mathematical statements that, that need to be reasoned about or put through theorem provers or increasingly now put through model checkers in order to demonstrate counterexamples that show why the system won't work for and has a particular bug uh, by producing an example of, of where it will fail if you have made a mistake and, and there, is, there is still something that, uh, that can't be proved. So the tool set is getting more powerful because more academics are, are working on, on being able to work with these sorts of verification conditions and those tools can be added into the available tools to, to people using Spark. So why don't everybody do it? And this is a problem I've been wrestling with for decades. And, and of course, the answers are all, all the standard ones. You know, you, they're, they're these. You, you've got genuine practical problems. You know, if, if what you're doing is modifying a, a monolithic chunk of legacy software that you don't understand, then it's going to be jolly difficult to, to do it using a, an approach like, like this because there's, you're interfacing with so you know, even if you're writing some new code, you're interfacing with so much stuff that you can't define properly that it becomes very difficult. Um, mostly, though, it's that people don't believe that there's value in it they don't feel they need to use these approaches because they're getting on, you know, they're, they're making money and yes, they get, they get failures and, and they create software that's buggy and has cybersecurity vulnerabilities, but their customers put up with it so they're not under great commercial pressure to introduce better methods. Um, and you even get, you know, the one at the bottom where if we train our programmers, they'll leave uh, because they'll be able to get higher salaries. And I've been meeting that criticism ever since the 1970s when we were trying to introduce structured methods into, into companies and there was resistance. 
So there's a, a raft of reasons, some of them good and some of them not good at all that cause people not to use these sorts of methods. But I hope that I've convinced you that, that Dijkstra was right and that it is practical and possible to write software it, for, for a wide range of applications at uh, cost effectively and, and write software that is virtually defect free so that, that you can guarantee it, you can give warranties for it. And we gave a, a 10 year warranty for that CDIS system that we bet, bet the company on and we got called on twice I think and neither of them was a significant problem and we fixed them under warranty. Um, those things are, are practical now. It's, it's taken 45 years to get here from, from what Dijkstra said, but, but it is practical. And so we must become less tolerant of companies that are writing software in the traditional way in order to put some pressure on them to, to clean up the mess that is now cyberspace and, and which has created a, a world in which Cybersecurity is a, is a tier one risk on the National Risk Register, not just in this country, but, but around the world.